160,000 people died of lung cancer within the U.S. just last year. That's more than breast, prostate, and colon cancer all combined. In this chart, you can see the incident distribution of these four leading cancer types. Note that both breast and prostate cancer are more common than lung cancer. Now let's look at the death distribution and pay special attention to lung cancer. Lung cancer is responsible for nearly 60% of these deaths. And there are two reasons for this, the mammogram and the prostate exam. These two exams provide early detection, and early detection saves lives. My name is Bayard Donaldson, and we are VOC Diagnostics. We present to you Vitalung, a lung cancer screening device that can be for lung cancer what the mammogram is for breast cancer. We are here for one reason, to seek your investment so that we can dramatically change these lung cancer statistics. Vitalung is the result of over three years and nearly $1 million of research. A multidisciplinary team from the University of Louisville combined innovations in engineering, chemistry, and biomarker research to create this patent-pending product that can save 130,000 lives and over $2 billion a year within the U.S. alone. And none of this would be possible without CHAMP, our very special contributor. Yes, CHAMP's a dog. But numerous studies have shown that dogs have the ability to detect cancer, lung cancer, simply by smelling a person's breath. Now, don't be nervous next time your neighbor's dog sticks its nose in your face. These, these, uh, these studies only used highly trained animals. But it's the science behind this that is so intriguing. It turns out the dogs are smelling the minute changes in the volatile organic compounds, or VOCs, within the person's breath. The lung cancer, it emits a specific VOC signature that the dogs pick up on. In Vitalung, it works in much the same way, only better. By capturing these VOCs, Vitalung can accurately and non-invasively diagnose a patient with lung cancer. Unfortunately, most lung cancer is not diagnosed until a patient starts exhibiting symptoms. And at this point, they're likely in stage three or stage four, where their chance of survival beyond five years is less than 20%. And this is where Vitalung makes its impact. If by being screened with Vitalung, the patient's cancer can be identified at its earliest stage, where their chance of survival with proper treatment is around 80%. Our goal is simple. It's to reduce lung cancer mortality by making Vitalung a critical element in the annual exams of the millions of people who are at high risk for lung cancer. So now that you understand the background of Vitalung, I'd like to introduce our Chief Marketing Officer, Justice Zills, who can walk us through how Vitalung works and how it's used. Justice? Thank you, Byron. So you may be wondering, how do the volatile organic compounds in a person's breath change as a result of cancer? Well, on a molecular level, the lung cancer outgrows its oxygen supply. This creates a hypoxic region, meaning it's starved for oxygen. In this region, the tumor eats the cells and tissues and excretes an abnormal level of certain volatile organic compounds. So how do we capture these VOCs? If a person is deemed to be at high risk of lung cancer, they will first breathe into a one liter medical gas sample bag. This bag is then dated and shipped to a lab where it is pushed across the Vitalung chip. Vitalung captures the VOCs and is analyzed using a mass spectrometer that identifies the types and concentration of the VOCs. This VOC pattern is compared to our proprietary pattern linked to lung cancer, and a diagnosis can be determined. These results are then sent back to the patient's provider who meets with the patient to discuss the results and determine the proper follow-up. Now let's talk about our target market. There are approximately 314 million people in the U.S. There are over 94 million current and former smokers that are at high risk. This is a potential $18.8 billion market. However, our initial targeted user will be the 7 million at greatest risk, as identified by the American Lung Association. The demographics of this classification are the 55 to 74-year-old 30-pack year smokers. So why now? The recent results from the National Lung Screening Trial, which is the largest trial to date conducted by the National Cancer Institute, show that a low-dose CT scan program can reduce lung cancer mortality by 20%. These results have led the National Comprehensive Cancer Network to strongly recommend lung cancer screenings to those at high risk. Additionally, helping to validate Vitalung's market acceptance, WellPoint, a health insurer, has approved lung cancer screenings for reimbursement. Others are following suit. The current competition for Vitalung comes from the imaging devices used to detect cancer. 
These are low dose CT scans, CT scans, PET scans, and MRIs. All of these methods are accompanied by serious risks, including radiation exposure, high false positive rate, reader error, and a later detection of cancer. Our primary competition comes from low dose CT scans. Today, if you were to have a low dose CT scan, you would lie on a cold, hard platform where you're zapped with enough radiation to reduce your life expectancy by 180 days per screening. Not to mention radiation can also cause cancer. If they do find a mass, there's still a 96% chance that it's not cancerous, leading, leading to further unnecessary costs, tests, and anxiety. These imaging devices detect lung, lumps. Vitalung detects cancer. With Vitalung, a patient simply breathes into a medical gas sample bag. Vitalung is much less expensive, but more importantly, early human testing shows it to be over 85% accurate, with a false positive rate of less than 10%. Also, VOCs have proven to provide early detection, up to 10 days before the cancer cells are visible to the naked eye. Now, this is critical because the current methods rely on the visible evidence to detect the cancer. Vitalung will replace these initial methods and become a critical element in the annual exams for the millions of people at risk of lung cancer. So now that you have a better understanding of our market and competitors, I'm going to hand it over to J.D. Eddington, our COO, to talk about our IP. J.D.? Thank you, Justice. We currently have an exclusive option to license the technology behind Vitalung from the University of Louisville. We're in negotiations for the terms of an exclusive license agreement, and we'll have this finalized by May. We also have a patent pending that covers the micro preconcentrator, also referred to as the chip, the chemical coating, and the biomarker pattern linked to lung cancer. Now, the, the uh, coating creates a chemical reaction with the compounds in the breath, allowing Vitalung to capture VOCs in parts per trillion. This is a far more sensitive level than other micro preconcentrators. So basically, the more sensitive, the more accurate. Another important piece of IP is the biomarker pattern. Now, we're looking for compounds that are created organically within the body. And this eliminates the need to test the ambient air for each patient. We also have an international PCT option in anticipation of expansion into global markets. And finally, the technology behind Vitalung can be applied to any disease, disorder, or cancer for which a biomarker pattern is found. Now, although we will position ourselves for acquisition at each of the critical milestones, we understand that we must be prepared to execute a sustainable business model. Sales will be outsourced to group purchase organizations and oncology sales networks. These groups combined will allow us to reach 90% of primary care physicians and clinics. This equates to more than 375,000 buyers. We will provide prepaid shipping labels to customers that don't have the means to analyze the sample so they can very simply and easily ship the sample to a nearby lab for analysis. This bar chart illustrates the cost components as they relate to the sale price of Vitalum. Of these components, there are two that are critical to the manufacturing and operations, the chip and the gas sample bag. The chip begins life as a common test grade silicone wafer, then it's etched, diced, and coated in a proprietary chemical salt. The gas sample bag and the valve are a leak proof design, ensuring the integrity of the sample throughout the shipping process. Our cost is about $40 per test, which we will sell for $200. Now that we've discussed the technology behind Vitalung, let me introduce you to our management team. Dr. Sean Fu is our chief scientific officer, one of the co-inventors of Vitalung, and he is an integral part of our team. Bayer Donaldson is our chief executive officer, and he has a background in strategy and risk analysis from J.P. Morgan Chase. I'm J.D. Eddington, the chief operations officer, and I have a background in engineering and operations from the U.S. military. Nick Moscato is our chief financial officer, and he has experience in ventures and mergers and acquisitions. He's led more than $2 billion in acquisitions from Humana. And Justice Zills is our chief marketing officer, and he has a background in health science and marketing from ECS Inc. Now we understand there may be some gaps in our collective experience, so we've assembled an elite board of advisors to help fill some of those gaps. Some of the highlights, Dr. Michael Nance, another one of the co-inventors of Vitalung, and he brings a background in chemical engineering. Pascal Deschalais has taken multiple pharmaceutical startups through the FDA approval process and on to successful exits. Now, we also have a number of key partnerships. New Century Health 
is an oncology benefits manager that has already agreed to recommend Vitalung as the first line of lung cancer screening to oncologists in their network. Current human efficacy trials are being conducted at the University of Louisville with the help of the James Graham Brown Cancer Center and Jewish Hospital. And finally, the Emergo Group is our third party process approval vendor and they're gonna help us navigate the FDA approval process. Now I'll turn it over to Nick Moscato, our CFO, to discuss key milestones. Nick? Thanks, JD. As JD mentioned, we plan on engaging the Emergo Group to be our FDA process approval consultant. Emergo has helped over 1,000 companies achieve regulatory compliance. Based on our initial meetings and conversations with the Emergo Group, Vitalum considered a class three medical diagnostic and require pre-market approval before we can begin sales. Given this classification, and coupled with the fact that Vitalung is a non-invasive diagnostic, we believe the FDA approval process should take two to two and a half years and will, will require 100 to 300 human clinical trials spread amongst three different testing locations. We plan on engaging the Emergo Group to begin work on our pre-IDE submission in June, and they've already committed to the timeline that you see on the screen. Now, along with engaging the Emergo Group, there are a number of other key milestones that we must achieve in order to bring additional value to our company. In 2013, we will focus our initial efforts on completing the human efficacy trial that Dr. Fu is currently in the midst of, as well as raise our $3.8 million equity investment round. In 2014, Vitalung will enter the human clinical trial phase of the FDA approval process. 2015 will bring completion of the FDA approval process, followed by a successful market launch in 2016, culminating with an exit via acquisition in 2017. Now, for those investors willing to participate in our $3.8 million equity raise, you can expect to receive 45.8% ownership in the company on a fully diluted basis. Our cap tail can be seen on this screen behind you. Now let's quickly run through some of the summary financials for VOC Diagnostics. Revenue is projected at $20 million in 2016, ramping to $37 million in 2017. EBITDA follows a similar growth trajectory, capping out at $6.8 million at time of exit. If you further break down these sales projections, the 185,000 Vitalunk devices that we must sell in order to achieve $37 million in revenue equates to only 2.6% of the total 7 million Americans considered at highest risk for lung cancer actually being administered the diagnostic. So given this low market penetration and coupled with the fact that we already have an initial indication of interest from New Century Health, an oncology benefits manager with over 2 million patients in their network, we feel fairly confident in these sales projections. After two years of successful sales, VOC Diagnostics will be an attractive acquisition target for a larger medical device company or a laboratory. Given the cost pressures facing the medical device industry brought on by impending healthcare reform, a number of traditional makers of medical devices are looking for lower cost alternatives to offer to their customers. Vitalung helps fill this need. Based on current industry M&A multiples, VOC Diagnostics will have a $47.4 million terminal year valuation, equating to a 7x EBITDA multiple. At this valuation target, our investors can expect to receive a 54% IRR and a seven times cash on cash return. So even though a cancer sniffing dog might be cute, it's probably not investment worthy. On the other hand, there's Vitalung. Non-invasive, highly accurate, simple to use, cost effective, but most importantly, life saving. Absolutely investment worthy. We are VOC Diagnostics and we thank you for your time. It is a possibility. We think by going through um, PMA, it actually increases the barriers to entry for other competitors. It makes that a predicate device, and then they would have to follow that path. Well, so here's the problem. You're buying yourself two years and several million dollars extra cost to go a PMA route because you think it might make a small barrier, it might create some barrier to entry. You ain't the only biomarker out there, though. You have other biomarkers like exosomal pathways, which could also potentially be diagnostic tools for lung cancer. And by taking that extra couple of years to go the PMA route, you may lose the opportunity that you would have if you got to market sooner. Why not look at the CLIA route? Um, we, we agree that, that, that CLIA is an option. However, we, we still think that, and you're right, there are other, some, some other uh, VOC competitors, but 
The proprietary knowledge that we have when it comes to the biomarker pattern and the way that the chip is etched and coated, we're able to capture these particles on, on a parts per trillion level, which no matter what is out there, that is the finest level that you can capture it on. There's no other chip out there or no other analysis out there that can capture it that accurately. So we think we still think that going the FDA approval route is, is the way to go, just because we'll have the best product with a high barrier enter, with high barrier to entry after that. So help me understand um, the components of your um, the $200. Um, you said it costs 40, you'll sell for 200. Um, what does that 200 include? What what is it that you're selling for $200? So for $200, the what the patient will interact with only the medical gas bag. That's all the patient will see. That um, that will then be put into a box, shipped to a lab. At the lab, that will contain our Vitalung chip, which one of you has right now. Um, the the air sample then gets pressed over the Vitalung chip, analyzed by a mass spectrometer, and the and then the results are output. So to the patient, it involves blowing in a bag and getting your results. Right, but so who who earns? So you have to install these chips at a lab? Um, not install. They're, they're just analyzed through a mass spectrometer at a lab. Okay, okay. But the lab doesn't bill for that? You bill for that? We bill for that. Okay. I bet you have to pay the lab. They, they, would, they would charge us for the analysis, and that's built into our $40 that's cost. That's okay. But. You're, are you selling an assay, or are you selling product? You're selling an assay, right? I'm sorry, well, I, the charge, the $200, the $200 reimbursed charge is for the assay. It's not for the product, it's not for the cost of consumption, it's just for the asset. Right, okay, right. And so the question is, who, which lab? Are you going to create a lab? Which, which lab? So who's, who's the lab that's uh, providing the service? And if it's you know, uh, packaged to go to a central lab, <laughs> uh, why aren't you, um, well, your, your revenue, I'm trying to understand your revenue model. You're charging who for the asset? You're charging the, the payor? Yeah, so it, this is a, reimburs a reimbursable product. I think it falls under CPT code 99456, which is reimbursable for a breath test of $165. Um, we are planning on using a third-party lab, a lab corporate request. We have no, no plans to own a lab. So what we would do is vend this through a lab they would then receive this test sample, analyze it at one of their labs or a reference lab that they network with, and we would get the result, results back from them. So why don't you just license it? License the? License the, the, the assay. Do the CLIA and license the assay. I mean, like, I guess that is an option. We, we just felt like, felt like the FDA, FDA process allows us some other options as far as an exit um, strategy. A lot of medical devices that we've seen have been acquired, you know, in stage two human clinical trials before or after that. So though we did build out our business plan to to have some operations in, and it would be our goal, and I think JD mentioned this in his part of the speech, to take this thing to market after we reach a number of different milestones, and, and ideally we would sell it before operations even began. Can you just talk a little bit about that sales strategy and that distribution model? It's one thing to have a great product, it's another thing for other people to know about it and sure. to use it. So what would be the strategy to penetrate those people who already have these great um, pieces of equipment, they've invested a lot of money, they're amortizing them, and they're not really going to want to you know, undo all that until they've gotten their money out of those, your alternate, I cannot recall the name of the other year of competition. So how, do you, how are you going to structure that distribution? How are you going to penetrate that market with all that other capital and sort of, um, um, how should I say it, accepted way of doing business? Sure. So we, would, we will manage the relationship between a number of different group purchasing organizations and oncology sales networks. And the top 10 of those actually sell to 90% of the primary care physicians in the U.S. So that would be the distribution method. We would, we would essentially manage 10 relationships through GPOs and these oncology sales networks. What do they take for margin? Well, that, that would be a negotiation. It's a, it turns out to be a percentage of revenue. But, but GPOs are order takers. They don't have people who proactively sell or try and persuade opinion leaders that they should change out what they're doing, which is an imaging approach. 
no GPO is ever going to say replace imaging with this other. So, so and how are you, you going to get KOLs, key opinion leaders in the industry, to adopt this alternative approach to the established imaging that they are used to doing? So we, we are not by any means trying to replace low-dose CAT scans as the current method of, of industry. We're trying to eliminate waste from unnecessary testing. So our test would become the very first test in someone's diagnosis with lung cancer. So you would assume. Who's going to persuade, who's going to persuade the, the community of providers? So you're worried about that's physician what they, updates? That's, that that's mm -hmm. what they should do. No GPO is ever going to persuade them to do anything. It's just you know, tell me what you want and I'll deliver it to you. Understood. It, and it's a, so it's a question of physician uptake. And we've talked to any doctor that will give us five seconds to listen to them. And the things we've found are doctors don't like to do things new unless they get paid for them. This, however, does not, and this really does not involve a doctor doing anything new. This can be administered by a simple lab tech. It can be analyzed by a lab tech as well. They, the doctor doesn't have to interact with this at all. It can be something as easy as you go in for your annual exam every year, and then at the end of it, he says, by the way, blow in this bag. The doctors don't do anything unless it adds to their bank account. How are you adding to the doctor's kind of personal economics? Well, we, or, or, the, or the ACO's economics, or the hospital's economics. Sure, so we, we've talked to two, both of the doctors on our advisory board, and because of how simple this is to use, and because it's not taking, it's not adding paperwork or adding any additional work to the doctor's day, they don't seem to think that physician uptake is going to be an issue. So a um, question I had had to do with, um, from what I understand, this is likely to be able to diagnose something at an earlier stage than you could with the CT scan. Is that fair? Yes, sir. Okay. So if that's true, all right, so you, you've got some microscopic cancer in a patient that you just detected with this chip, and someone's going to probably want to confirm that before they start old doses of chemotherapy to try to dig around with surgery. So what, how is this actually going to change the course of events for that patient who has a very microscopic uh, early stage cancer? So treatment. This, this gets back to the expected, the life expectancy of, of the different stages of treatment. So we can, we can catch cancer stage zero. Right. So the, you, you blow onto our chip, you find out that you have signs of lung cancer. The next step then would be to have a low-dose CAT scan to see where that mass would be. So the, the benefit here is, is the early diagnosis of it. It doesn't necessarily change the treatment course. It just eliminates, you know, in, you come in with a hack, and in, instead of blowing on the vital lung chip, you automatically get a low-dose CAT scan, and there's a 96% chance that what they find is not cancer. Right, but if, if it's so early that it's not detected by the CAT scan, so, you know, I, I, I'm curious to know how you get to that next step, or right? you've got a positive result from the chip. How do you get to the next step, and, you know, will physicians actually treat based on this indication? Uh, if they can't detect it with the CAT scan, if it's not verified by the CAT scan, will it be considered to be a false positive? I mean, where, where you know, how, how is this actually going to make a difference for that patient who does not have a very a large enough mass to be t detected by the CAT scan? I think it works in, in conjunction with, with the visible evidence. So you continue then to monitor that person as opposed to just sending them in the way and then maybe they come back in two or three years when the cancer is developed to stage three. You can keep closer tabs on this patient to, to when, you know, when a biopsy is necessary. You can, you can be on that right away. Right, so it's kind of like one of those watch and wait sorts of things, which I don't think any of us are ever comfortable with. Well, and that, you know, and that gets to if, if there's a new treatment towards cancer that can, you know, that can stop but the watch and wait. Then that, but that's beyond our... Yeah, you have to ask whether the provider or Sure, such as your employer would be interested in actually paying for treatment based on the chip and so on. I mean, or paying for a, uh, a CAT scan based on the chip. I mean, I, the question is with a lot of diagnostic tests is are you getting information you actually act on and you can do something about? And so, I, that if you're detecting a cancer that is large enough to be confirmed by a, uh, a CAT scan, I find I think that's great because uh, this would be a cheaper way of getting those people screened. But um, if it's a cancer that's very early stage where you have the greatest potential to actually do something about it, I'm not sure how this changes the game. Well, if you don't mind, I'll step in for a second. I think the, uh, the real problem within the industry is that there isn't a screening method for lung cancer that's endorsed by the larger medical community. 
because low dose CT scans have the radiation risks, they're expensive, so doctors aren't necessarily willing to put someone who's in a high risk pool in there on an annual basis to get the screening. We feel that Vitalong can become that screening device. So if you fall within that high risk pool, you get analyzed, and, uh, you get an annual screening using Vitalong so that you can catch it as quickly as possible. If you identify it when it's microscopic and you can't see it on the low dose CT scan, then you get on a plan where you're looking at, looking at the patient on an annual or semi-annual basis to catch it and its location as early as possible so you can start the treatment. So, um, so I still think you have a bit of a distribution um, challenge on um, how to get this, because I think right now your plan is it needs to be in the hands of doctors in their offices. Um, but so does that test require blowing into the little bag? Does it require any special handling like contamination? or So have you considered, so why wouldn't it be something like a pregnancy test that's sitting on the shelf at Walgreens um, where someone can walk in and buy it and do it themselves and mail sure. it to the lab. Sure, the, the over-the-counter at-home model is interesting. They do you know same thing with A1C testing. Um, for lung cancer, we really don't want to take the provider out of the equation. We think that that diagnosis needs to be given by a provider with your provider so you can get your treatment plan through them. I think removing that piece of the equation is a risky proposition. So, so let's move back to, to George's question. Let's assume that the provider has to be involved. Uh, the payor, you have one payer who says they'll pay for screening. The payer does not, in general, want to pay $200 per test to screen the entire population. Uh, in general, you um, have to have a persuasive case that it will reduce the cost to the payer, ultimately, because there's something you can do. And you haven't made a very compelling case that payers will embrace the idea of universal screening to a large portion of the population when there may be nothing that the provider can then do other than wait until the tumor emerges to the point where it can then be test, uh, tested on imaging equipment before they can actually take action. Just why, for one more why would the provider? I mean, the uh, payer want to uh, pay for that universal test. So there's, so if the movement continues towards a national annual lung cancer screening program for the seven million people that are at highest risk for lung cancer, this eliminates potential unnecessary waste through using doing that program via low dose CAT scan. So the, in a in a in an industry of forty billion dollars, that's unnecessary imaging. This takes that cost down quite a bit. So, so you're, you're one presuming you're presuming national screening uh, as a prerequisite for this being adopted commercially. Well, then there's movement towards that just like, you know, the mammogram and the prostate exam have and gained so much movement. Can I ask about your pre-money valuation real quick before we run yes. out of time? You've got a pre-money valuation of 4.5 million and you're trying to raise 3.8 million. What alternative financing choices did you look at or milestones, lesser amounts, different valuations, and why did you land on this, this number? Um, so we've, we've looked at grants. We, we actually, our uh, chief scientist, Dr. Fu, is currently head down in the office coming up with grant proposals. We have a potential grant from the DOD in the process right now. There's a National Science Institute grant that's coming up as well. So we've used grant methodology for, for raising additional capital. And as we mentioned in the presentation, we, uh, in spring of last year, we, we received uh, $650,000 from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, so we've, we've had some success in that arena and we continue to plan on using that as we go. Thank you guys very much.